50 billion practice. Thank you, Nigel. Good morning, everyone. So, um, so yesterday, we, for those of you who are here, we talked about sort of the, the status of the clinical aspects of our program at Cornell and alluded to a little bit with questions from Regina and the group on how we um, sort of foresee translating some of these sort of novel discoveries into actual clinical practice. And that's what I want to talk about today is sort of this, the systems we have in place to do that and sort of how near or far we might be from that. Um, as I mentioned, sort of the precision medicine overall goal is to have the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And you know, sometimes not always the treatment's gonna be available for those patients. Um, and so we need to develop methods to do that. And so one of the philosophies that I think our program has uh, that's been really great for precision medicine is that uh, the easier access you have to the research tools, the data, I think the more likely that our scientists are actually using that data. And so it makes the research easier for them to do, which means it's what would be more likely to happen. So it's kind of like the old uh, Field of Dreams movie where if you build it, he will come. So similarly to what I showed yesterday, you know, we have our research... <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought you had a question. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, we have the uh, similar uh, CBIO portal that's available for everyone with our own internal data. So all the researchers at Cornell, um, whether they're part of the Precision Medicine Institute or not, can log on to this website and see all the data for all the patients in an anonymized fashion so that if they have you know, questions about their, their tumor types or their mutations they've seen in a certain patient, they can go into the rest of the cohort and look and see and they can actually compare our cohort to all the other cohorts publicly available on CBIO portal. So they can compare results from Cornell to the results from TCGA studies. And I think that really helps for, for our researchers to, um, you know, at their desk, at, at their leisure, sort of look at these results and compare and contrast and answer questions or find new questions they be able to ask that then can blossom into further research studies. And so some of the ones you know, that we mentioned is that you know, our researchers have found that there's been a high prevalence of germline DNA re repair mutations in our cohort compared to other cohorts. Again, this is an aggressive cohort, so it's not surprising. We've also looked at sort of the evolution of metastatic tumors in multiple samples because all the samples are available as well on CBIO portal from these patients. And ultimately, you know, in the past three years alone, we've had over 250 publications in very sort of high impact journals from our group of collaborators um, at the Precision Medicine Institute at Cornell. But as I mentioned yesterday, currently our, our clinical program only offers whole exome sequencing as an official validated report with laboratory uh, approval. Um, we do have our RNA-seq clinical recording on the horizon, so hopefully within the next year or so. And then also, the organoid platform has already undergone some developments to become a clinical tool. Although some of the barriers that you know, prevent us from doing this, as we discussed yesterday, is that the standard of care still is the standard of care. And so circumventing what normally would be happening to a patient uh, because of some sort of novel or interesting research discovery um, is still uh, difficult to, to get around with um, approval of drugs. Um, and also sort of just the medical legal aspects of it. Um, there's also the regulatory hurdles to doing some of these things. Um, you know, so organoid platforms, to my knowledge, have not ever been sort of a clinically validated tool by any you know, FDA approved laboratory. And so navigating the pathway to get that into a clinical practice has been a little bit challenging. And then also, um, while I think that our clinicians at, at, at Cornell are very interested in precision medicine and are on top of things, um, they also sort of need to be better educated about sort of the, the way to navigate the program. So things like RNA-seq and organoid platforms require you know, fresh samples, which required yesterday, as I mentioned, the development of a communication line so that those samples are fresh and rapidly provided to the laboratory for development. A lot of times they'll think about precision medicine for their patients only after getting the diagnosis, at which point it's too late. And so there's also a lot of uh, development in our education, I mean, that needs to um, uh, be implemented in the institution to broaden the uh, extent. And so this is sort of the, the outline that I mentioned yesterday. We have our, our laboratory that's approved for whole exome sequencing and almost for RNA sequencing, but there's a lot more that we can do to translate these results for the patient. 
Um, a few years ago, we started our organoid program at Cornell, um, you know, using the classes or petri dishes here. We have a nice publication by Chantal Pali, who is in uh, uh, Germany now, um, developing sarcomas in the laboratory because they tended to grow quite well. Um, as those of you here who work with organoids know, there's, there's a, a lot of discrepancy between the tumor types that, that can grow in vitro. Um, but sarcomas grew quite well, led to a nice publication. This is an old, from the paper showing sort of success rate. Um, for a patient drives xenografts, we've had pretty good success um, if the organoids grow. Um, but as, again, as the organoids are meant, I mentioned before, only about a 50% success rate still, but we're working on improving the media. Um, we have moved to the microfluidics uh, aspect of growth, so it makes it easier and a little bit better. Um, and from the paper, you know, we've shown that the organoids that we can develop in these patients are quite faithful to the tumor type. So the top row here is the actual H&E slides from the patient's surgery or biopsy that was received by me in the laboratory. You know, the organoids um, in culture um, grow as these sort of uh, organoids or spherules. We make H&Es of those clusters of cells, and the cells still maintain their fidelity to the original tumor type that was grown um, in the patient. And then after implanting these organoids into xenograph models um, and making H&E slides of them after a few sort of growth cycles, they still sort of are quite faithful to the original morphology of the tumor. And so we were sort of very um, impressed by this and thought that things would go crazy because a lot of times when you grow things in the laboratory, it goes haywire and starts to look like a sarcoma whenever it's a carcinoma. But these tend to maintain their original sort of appearance. And even after doing um, some genomic analyses of these after multiple passes, I mentioned yesterday, I think, uh, you know, some of these organoids have been, grown, have been grown for more than 30 passes, and the genomic stability and fidelity is still maintained across all these generations, including implantation into xenografts and growth in xenografts as well. Um, so I do think that they maintain the uh, infrastructure, they maintain the information of the original tumor even after being grown in the laboratory. Um, we have our drug screening program that um, has at least 120 FDA-approved compounds as well as hundreds of other non-FDA-approved compounds that can be used to test these drugs, or test these tumors, um, first as a primary drug screen, but also in combinations um, with the other drugs. And then ultimately going back to the patient's uh, organoids and xenografts to test them um, in, uh, in human or, or sorry, in animal models. And there's a lot of variety of pathways that you know, Anton mentioned yesterday in his uh, pathway analysis that we, we look at um, with these drugs to see what may or may not be useful. Um, and so from an earlier paper that we had out, we sort of showed that you know, we can look at these organoids and, and the, the drug responses to them, um, tumors that have the same morphology under the microscope and even some of the same mutations with APC mutations in both these tumors have quite opposite sort of uh, uh, resistance and um, sensitivity curves to them. So one being a fatinib sensitive, or sorry, resistant, and the other one being a fatinib sensitive and vice versa with a trametinib. Uh, what was interesting though when we threw these multiple screens is that you know, addition of other non-classical drugs to the combinations can actually have a very uh, impactful change in the sensitivities and the, or the efficacy of these drugs. So for instance, trametinib, um, I'm sorry, we'll look at the focus on patient D, the second patient. In the, the first single screen pass, trametinib um, and if it was a, a resistant, a fatinib was sensitive, um, a fatinib um, plus virinostat actually improved drastically the, the cell kill um, of these patients. So a fatinib by itself you know, was successful, virinostat was successful, and together alone, uh, to, or together these patients, uh, these cells even had a more drastic response. Um, but normally this would not be a combination that we would provide in a clinic. And so seeing that in, the, in sort of these random sort of passes with the, with the organoids made for an interesting combination that this patient um, would be eligible for. Um, and then even in the xenografts, after looking at all these different combinations of drugs that were sensitive and resistant in the organoids, um, again, the fatinib virinostat combination showed the most drastic response to the tumor um, in the xenopatient, uh, the xenografts. Um, and through sort of genomics or analyses from the whole exome sequence between results, we've seen that there has been a strong correlation with what we'd expect drugs response. Um, with those that are in clinically practiced, uh, currently um, used. And so patients with P10 deletions um, in their organoids that were developed to, did have a positive response to mTOR inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors as, as expected, um, which was nice to see that the, there is agreement between what we see in the genomics and what we see in the organoids. 
So similar to our exome sequencing platform, where, where as I mentioned yesterday, there can be or there is a um, a dashboard available to follow through sort of all the steps of the process. We have a similar dashboard for organoid development so that we can log in and see, okay, what organoids are available currently, which ones, you know, are, are frozen down as aliquots for future. Um, have there been uh, PDXs tried from these? Have there had drug screens on these? Um, and all this information is sort of available sort of from anyone's office if they want to know sort of what's out there in the lab for current testing, whether it's their patient or not. So looking at some of the next steps we wanted to, to, to grow, those are the more the, sort of the immediate um, translations or, or, or uh, models we want to move into the clinical laboratory. Um, there's also you know, always new innovation, new innovative assays that are being developed that uh, we want to try out. Um, we're really sort of trying to focus on, given the uh, immunologic agents that are out there, immunotherapy um, responses to these organoids and xenografts. Um, as well as uh, RNA-seq data, I'll show you a little bit later. As I mentioned before, um, we've already moved over to a microfluidic aspect for the organoids um, and their growth, but we also want to try to continue to improve the success rates for these, um, these, these organoids. So we're also looking at cell-free DNA. A lot of this is in, common in collaboration with uh, industry, but also some of our own systems at Cornell are being used to uh, track uh, you know, EGFR mutations in patients with lung cancer and response to therapies. Um, we're looking at uh, new ways to calculate or predict immunotherapeutic responses with both exome sequencing, such as tumor mutation burden, as well as RNA sequencing um, and the immune contexture that's present. So as I mentioned, we now know that, uh, and as, I, as I alluded to yesterday, we're beyond sort of the, the tumor cell tumor target, we want to also target the microenvironment of cancers in order to improve therapies. And so it's no longer sort of just like one mutation in one drug, but we also have multiple mutations, multiple drugs in the tumor cells, as well as the environment around it. So uh, for some time now, we've had uh, VEGF inhibitors to, to prevent angiogenesis. Now we have uh, pd one inhibitors to promote the immune response to tumors. And that's one of the areas that we're looking at um, to try to improve response. And so some of the deconvolution that's been done from our bulk RNA sequencing data has allowed us to um, improve our prediction of patients that will, will not respond to immunotherapeutic agents based upon the immune environment that's present in their tumors. So looking at um, this analysis, we can go through, you know, and have previously um, looked at the TCGA cohorts and seen what kind of type of immune cells are present and ultimately been able to sort of deduce in our current patients those that are going to respond based upon their sort of T cell or, or macrophage subtype that's present in the tumor, which is I think quite exciting and it's not quite yet ready for prime time, but it's something that we'll, we'll have um, hopefully available to coming down the road. Um, we're also looking at uh, single cell analyses, and so when you do bulk sequencing, of course, you get an idea of what the mutational or allele rate is within the tumor itself, but talking about heterogeneity yesterday as well, um, we now are looking more into um, what actual mutations are in the same cell. So are they, you know, you might have P10 and P53 deletion in a prostate cancer, but they could be in different clones that you wouldn't know until you actually look at the individual cell and see them working together in tandem. So that's kind of an exciting um, area that we're looking at, especially in, um, in our mouse models and, and tumor models of development to make sure that what we're developing in these tumors or in these mice is actually happening in the same cells as opposed to just being a, a sort of a heterogeneous analysis. Similarly to what you guys have here in your impressive laboratories, we're also trying to, to develop the, the, the Tetanic single cell RNA-seq as well um, to further sort of uh, elucidate what immune cell types are present within our patient samples. So putting all of those different data together, exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, um, we have a variety of tools that we're looking at um, published last year to develop a predictive model, which we think is about 90% accurate in predicting responders' immunotherapy when you combine not only um, potentially routine PD-L1 immunohistochemistry, but also looking at the whole exome sequencing data, looking at the neoantigens, so similar to the mutational burden, which, which tumors are the ones that are, that are actually providing new targets for the immune system, as well as what are the genes and cells that are, genes that are being expressed in the immune cells, what immune cell types are there, you know, are the T cell repertoires diverse enough to handle uh, uh, these new antigens, or are they too sort of narrow? Um, but altogether, they, we think that we're going to be able to have a, a, a very high predictive rate for immunotherapeutic agents beyond uh, what's out there now currently, which is PDL1 and potential mutation burden. 
And as a pathologist, I can tell you that PDL1 is, is uh, it's almost like flipping a coin where the interpretation is very difficult, it's very variable. So from one laboratory to the next, from one pathologist to the next, you can get two very widely different results um, where the PDL1 status is not a very uh, easy to interpret stain, but that's all we have now is FDA approved for giving this drug. So this hopefully will help, will help us improve. Um, I, ideally, we want these sort of analyses that on the research side, of course, take months to complete. Uh, we want to improve that down to ultimately be within about, you know, a 30 day range so these patients can, after the major surgeries, come back uh, a few weeks from surgery and have a, a plan in place for them to be treated. I think it's a little bit idealistic at this point, but uh, you know, the goal is to get there. And also, as I mentioned before, with the organoids, um, we want to try to keep improving the conditions that are out there for them for growth so that we can improve the success rate. Um, one interesting idea um, that uh, Shaheen Rafi has been working with the group on is, is trying to develop, again, with the microenvironment, these sort of pseudo-vascularized organoids where, of course, there's not actually blood vessels pumping through them, but the, the tumor cells are admixed with sort of endothelial-type stem cells in order to see the interactions that these cells have with, with the vasculature um, as they grow in culture, which is pretty cool. Um, as I also mentioned yesterday, we're trying to, to, to move over to xenografts and zebrafish more often than, than mice, just for the ease of growth. Um, and we've already moved over to the microfluidics for our organoid development and drug screens, which is hopefully going to really uh, improve the, the workflow there. Um, and then this is an example sort of our, our high throughput drug screening lab, hundreds of drugs screened through um, using the lab site system here. Um, with a variety of compounds to get the results that hopefully will be useful to the patient in the future. Um, so we want to go from these sort of basket trials where everyone is just treated blindly with a drug to at least patient-oriented trials where the, the targeted drugs that they're being uh, given are based upon the genomics and transcriptomics of the patient samples. And um, one aspect of this that we've sort of worked on is to uh, develop the vitamin C trial um, at Cornell, and so this is a high-dose vitamin C uh, cohort. So patients with KRAS BRF mutations have been shown to sort of respond to um, high-dose vitamin C, and so what we're looking at is patients diagnosed with colon pancreatic lung cancers with these mutations are treated before their surgery with high-dose vitamin Cs, and then afterwards we're now collecting these samples, doing whole exome sequencing on the tumors um, compared to the pre-treatment biopsies. Um, as well as developing uh, organoids from them to see what the changes have been in the tumor cells. So, you know, part of the goal of being here at the conference is to expand our collaborations, which we're very excited to do um, with, with Kazan and, and the great facilities and expertise that you have here. Um, you know, some of the things that we're looking into, of course, is to develop more tissue samples, sequence more tissue samples, get a better understanding of the, of the landscape that's out there, more organoids of different tumor types, um, improve their success rates, uh, we're also looking at interesting cohorts, so these rare and sort of like orphan type diseases, we'd like to collect more of those to sort of see and compare to um, the more common tumors that are out there. And so I really look forward to uh, continuing the conference and working with you guys to develop some interesting questions and ideas for future, for future work. Um, and with that, I'll, you know, thank you for, for your, interest, or your uh, attention this morning. I'm happy to take any sort of questions you guys might have. Anton, yes. One question or six? Within the same. You think it's the same tumor, but response to it responds differently to different drugs. So within a single patient, you're asking, or across patients? No, across patients, we definitely see definitely see heterogeneity. So even for instance, like the patient, two patients I showed, you know, one obviously had KRAS and the mutations, but they both had an APC sort of driver. We think driver mutation. Uh, they had both drastic different responses, and I think those are kind of samples that we'd be interested to look at your pathway analysis to see, you know, what are might be the escape mechanisms or the resistance mechanisms that we couldn't pick up by sort of bulk sequencing, um, and or looking at the. Uh, sequencing of the organoids after the treatments to see, you know, expression levels that might have changed because of drugs and uh, that would open up the, the, the resistance pathway, which we're looking at as well too, you know, sort of sequencing these, uh, 
these organoids, we also sequence sort of before and after treatments to see comparative purposes. So it's an interesting area we're looking into. But no, we definitely see a lot of heterogeneity in the responses of these tumors, even if they have very similar morphologies and even somewhat similar mutational profiles. So, and was a sort of translation rate, I don't know if you can answer this, from organoids to patients? So if you see that organoid responds to the drug, will you predict that patient will respond to the drug? So, you know, these are generally, um, you know, are, are still currently taking time to develop. And so the goal of the organoids currently as they are is to potentially guide a second or third line therapy. So once they come through to us, they usually are already on some second or third line thing of care chemotherapy. The organoids are being used to sort of see what might be useful in the future. And it's a very low rate currently that we end up translating into the patients. I would say still it's more on the anecdotal side because we're still in the early stage of development. We still have very few organoids that are actually growing in culture because of difficulty with getting, first of all, from the biopsies and resections, enough tissue to grow organoids. And second of all, the success of growing them is, is difficult. So if you only have a 50% success rate, um, a quarter of which might grow long term, you know, the limitations there just prevent us from translating a lot of these into the patient samples. And so there's a lot of background work still needed in the laboratory to improve the success rate. Um, and then also on the other end, on the clinical side, to improve the timing, timeliness of the results that we can get back uh, for, for um, analysis. But I, I definitely know of a handful of patients that you know, failed the therapy that was, they were on while being treated, uh, while the organoids were growing, um, saw an interesting combination that ultimately was useful for them because it had the FDA approval, and so they were given those drugs, and they did have a, you know, at least a modest response, um, probably better than what the fourth-line therapy would have been just without any of the information. So it's promising, but we're not there yet. Um, uh, Sorry, could you the first part of the question? I see. So that's an interesting question. Um, we have not been looking at that currently but um, it's definitely something that would be worth looking at together, if that's an interest of yours, for sure. Uh, maybe I missed, uh, how did you pick the combination of drugs? So because of, uh, Dr. Anton was saying uh, that it was a uh, transcriptomic based uh, reconstruction of pathways uh, with uh, certain target speeds. And in your particular case, uh, how did you pick the combination? So generally, the way, that the way that they do it, it's more, it's more random analysis. It's nothing that's scientifically based, like Anton's system has. So we just sort of pick, um, have a, a set sort of a group of, of combinations we start with, generally one, one drug from one class, one drug from another class, and see if there's any sort of change whatsoever. If there is sort of some success with that, then we expand that to other combinations of both classes of drugs to see if there's a, a more refined approach with newer, older classes of, say, PA3 kinase inhibitors with, with uh, you know, um, even sort of a HER2 drug if it's a HER2 responsive tumor. And also, I think uh, you mentioned that you're doing pharmacogenetics, right? Uh, a little bit, yeah. It's not, a, it's not a major focus, but we do do some sort of pre and post treatment um, sequencing is that what you're for so for so currently what we're doing is just doing exome and RNA sequencing on the organoids so we're looking at everything we possibly can and then bioinformatically looking at the differences the change you know sort of fold change from pre and post treatments so it's not a specific target where it's just, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to miss anything. So we're doing the same exome and RNA sequencing that we do on the patient samples from the surgery on the organoids. And then if we have treatment responses, both before and after treatment. Sure. We have um, tried a few times. They tend not to live more than a few passes um, as a cell line, but yeah, it's, it's difficult, but you know, some of them, some of the more aggressive ones, you know, like these high-grade colorectal carcinomas or the neuroendocrine prostate small cell cancers do grow for a few passes, but it's not enough to establish yet for us our hands a cell line from them that's going to be consistently growing. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's, I have to say that we do see some differences with the organoids and the drug responses based upon just the, the quality of the organoids themselves. And so that's something that we obviously have to work on if we want to bring this into clinic. Sort of, that's a variable that is going to be changing from patient sample and organoid sample to organoid sample. And so, yeah, I mean, the ones that have, you know, more dense organoids growth, you know, sometimes we see more obvious responses. Um, and it may be something to do with the, the, the development of the organoid model, but it's something that we're working for, uh, working to try to improve. Um, happy to, to work with you on that too, since you're having similar difficulties. <laughs> I have one final question. Yes. Uh, do you envisage that you will have to do repeated organoid derivations from each patient after each failure of therapy? Uh, yeah, I think that that's one of the plans on the horizon, um, especially, you know, so one of our uh, researchers also does that to some extent on the hematopoietic side with PDXs that they, that they grow, um, and so they'll sort of, uh, you know, test the organoids and then um, try to manipulate them uh, in ways to, to see if there's any different responses, and also after the patient fails to the second line, go back, going back to them and seeing. So, you know, we want this to potentially be a, a lifelong resource for the patient. Um, but again, the tumors are also changing, as I said, from the metastases that develop and respond are also changing. And so we always try to push the clinicians in any situation of a progression of disease to obtain a new biopsy, because that's going to be more informative for the current status of that patient's disease. And we don't know what, what's, you know, what's been changing on, on that patient's tumor until we actually sequence that one again and grow some organoids from that. So. Yeah. Thank you guys. Our next speaker is Dr. Albert Good morning, everybody. My name is Albert Gimranov. I'm the Chief of the Department of Breast Cancer Surgery in the Republic of Oncological Dispensary of the Republic of Health of Tatarstan. We have a trouble with... Uh, sorry, yes, I'll have to contact Albert, probably. I'm not sure how... Do you know Nigel yesterday? Oh, sorry. sorry, that was easy. My presentation is about problem of a practice in oncology in our public in our country. But unfortunately, my presentation on Russian. I have no enough uh, experience in English, and Regina help to trans uh, 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 promise to help me with translation. Okay, please take that. Uh, I'm sorry for that. That was my mistake. I probably. Uh wasn't clear about the language, so I'll try to translate. I am not prepared. Uh, that's why it will take a bit more time <laughs> than I would love to. But uh, still, please, you can stop us and give questions to, during the presentations if you want. Uh, and we might take a bit more time. Sorry, I jump for it. <laughs> Сегодняшний день рак молочный, онкологическая проблема рак занимает второе место в России по смертности среди всех случаев смерти. Ежегодно умирает от рака порядка 300 тысяч пациентов и 600 тысяч новых случаев рака, рака онкологических заболеваний 
обнаруживается в России. За последние 10 лет онкология выросла примерно на 20%. Это тенденция, которая наблюдается во всех странах, не только в России. Но существует э, оценка эффективности проводимого лечения, проводимого лечения онкологической патологии в странах развитых и в странах бедных заключается в том, что при увеличении заболеваемости раком количество смертей от рака должно сокращаться, чего не наблюдается в России. По этому уровню мы гораздо ближе к бедным странам Африки и Азии. Uh, the difference between, like... UK, developed. Um, developed countries and less developed countries is actually uh, the number of deaths. Like if we see increase in incidents, we see uh, uh, decrease, uh, we don't see an increase in death or we see a better control of death. Uh, in uh, less developed countries, we see increase uh, in death as well. Unfortunately, Russia is closer to less developed countries. <coughs> На сегодняшний день рак перестал быть фатальным заболеванием, и благодаря современным технологиям хирургии, лучевой терапии, системной терапии позволяет выжить все большему и большему количеству пациентов, продлить срок их жизни. И Россия в этом смысле не исключение. На сегодняшний день, несмотря на все ограничения, которые существуют, наши врачи вылечивают порядка 50% пациентов с установленным диагнозом рак. рак. Uh, anyway, we see some success in cancer treatment in all countries, and Russia is not an exception. About half of our patients is get treated. Как показывает uh, опыт стран, успешно борющихся с раком, uh, <coughs> в этот процесс должны быть вовлечены не только медицинский персонал, но и еще правительство, uh, СМИ, общество, биз бизнес и пациентские организации. Uh, Taking an example of Cornell or any institute working in developed countries, we can say what cancer treatment is not only problem of medical centers. Uh, that is a process which requires uh, industry, uh, uh, media, uh, and uh, and many uh, organ organizations, organizations have been involved in the process. На сегодняшний день в России медицинский персонал принимает участие практически во всех этапах лечения рака. Это профилактика, скрининг, радикальное лечение, реабилитация, наблюдение и симптоматическая терапия. Nowadays, medical staff are taking part in all uh, processes, uh, starting with uh, diagnosis, treatment uh, and control of cases. В профилактике на сегодняшний день выделяются факторы, которые можно предотвратить, и есть факторы, которые нельзя предотвратить. Наиболее Явно на слуху у нас сейчас факторы, которые можно предотвратить, это курение ионизирующая радиация. Uh, for cancer diagnosis we have two types of factors. One uh, which we can uh, escape or uh, affect and second which we can't affect. During uh, f uh, list of factors which we can affect include smoking, uh, radiation. radiation, obesity. Uh, okay. В России начаты беспрецедентная борьба с курением. Эта привычка стала дорогой, она стала немодной. И большинство организаций сегодня направлены на эту тему публикаций. С радиацией ситуация такая же, с ионизирующим обучением, потому что после Чернобыльской катастрофы были разработаны новые подходы к защите и контролю над радиоактивными излучениями. Uh, in Russia now we have a, a control system to decrease uh, am amount of smokers, like there have been a governmental program to, to work on that problem. Uh, also after Chernobyl uh, uh, incident uh, we are trying to control uh, radiation. Uh, и этим двум факторам придается очень большое значение, которое активно обсуждается. Однако существует ряд факторов, которые не так активно обсуждаются. И люди вполне здоровые не задумываются о том, какой вред они себе наносят. Это и гиподинамия, и неправильно несбалансированное питание, и ожирение. 
smoking and radiation is well discussed in Russia. You can find a lot of articles about that, but we have a big list of factors which is not really uh, discussed and taken up uh, in Russia. И на сегодня профилактические мероприятия должны быть направлены на то, чтобы в медиа активно популяризировать здоровый образ жизни, популяризировать отказ от вредных привычек. И такой отказ в будущем должен привести к снижению заболеваемости рака молочной железы. Это те факторы, которые мы можем предотвратить сами, не привлекая медицинских работников. Спасибо, профилактика. Okay. Uh, the best thing we can do nowadays is uh, to switch to uh, active prophylactic Passive, passive, prophylactic. Uh, passive prophylactics basically decrease the uh, number of uh, bad habits which, which our population have and uh, try, try to uh, increase the popularity of a um, healthy lifestyle. В последнее время активно заговорили об активной профилактике, это медикаментозная хирургическая профилактика. Однозначный резонанс вызвала профилактическая мастектомия Анджелины Джоли, это на слуху у всех. То, что существует в Европе на протяжении последних 20-30 лет, обрело резонанс в России только после активной публикации, публикации по поводу Анджелины Джоли. Uh, It's, it's happened after uh, Angelina Jolie's story, when he did uh, mastectomy. Uh, before that, um, it wasn't discussed in Russia, but now more and more uh, um, people and doctors start to think about it. Но, несмотря на это, существует ограничение. Мы законодательно не можем выполнять пациентам профилактические мастектомии, если у них не реализовался рак молочной железы. Unfortunately, we can't do it in Russia at the moment because it's uh, uh, not in our treatment standards, and doctors are not allowed to do it here. Медикаментозная профилактика на сегодня активно используется вакцинизация от гепатита Б, что приводит к снижению заболеваний раком печени. Uh, the only way to decrease the cancer statistics is вакцинизация от гепатита Б, что приводит к снижению рака Hepatite B vaccination, uh, which leads to the decrease of и вакцинизация от папилломы вируса человека которая, к сожалению, не вошла в обязательный список прививок, но может в будущем снизить рак шейки матки. And papillomavirus vaccination, which is not at the moment in the list of the vaccines in Russia, but uh, it's been discussed and uh, hopefully in future we, can, we will introduce it too, to, to decrease incidence of cervical cancer. На сегодняшний день совершенно установлена связь между раком и возрастом. Чем старше становится пациент, тем больше вероятность того, что он доживет до своего рака. В Татарстане ситуация немного другая, потому что заболеваемость раком в среднем больше, больше чем в России, в два раза. In Tatarstan we have slightly different picture. We have twice more incidence of cancer as compared to Russia. Это связано с тем, что в Татарстане существует несколько моногородов, которые были построены в 70-е годы. И... Uh, that is connected to the cities which have been built in 70s. И туда съехались молодые люди, которые uh, сейчас достигли возраста пожилого и uh, сейчас они дожили до своих онкологических заболеваний. Uh, so the cities in 70s were populated by uh, young inhabitants and at, at the moment right now we, we reached the uh, age when uh, cancer rate is high. Хотя еще 20 лет они были экстремально низкие, гораздо ниже, чем во всех остальных регионах. Uh, for the same reason, 20 years ago, cancer incidents in Tatarstan were, were much lower uh, as compared to general Russian incident statistics. В России организовано большое количество профилактических осмотров и диспансеризации, направлено на осуществление эффективного скрининга. Uh, we have a number of uh, screening techniques, which is uh, uh, 
work on. We have a lot of government programs program. which uh, give us possibility to do effective screening. У нас существует на самом деле сегодня в мире существует пять эффективных методов скрининга. Among them five main screening types. Это рак шейки матки, рак молочной железы, рак толстой кишки, предстательной железы и рак легких. Эффективный скрининг подразумевает снижение смертности от рака по сравнению, если бы скрининг не проводился. Uh, applied techniques uh, allow us to decrease the uh, number of uh, deaths uh, as compared to a situation when we uh, don't use the screening for this type of cancers. Однако в России существует проблема осуществления скрининга в том числе, что видно по результатам скрининга рак шейки матки. Uh, but we have a problem uh, and we can uh, discuss it on on uh, example of cervical cancer. Uh, Скрининговые программы по раку шейки матки начаты давно, но к шестнадцатому году мы достигли количество случаев рака шейки матки и количество смертей от рака шейки матки такого же числа пациентов, какое было в Европе, в странах Западной Европы к началу 70-х годов до начала скрининга. Uh, Screening programs have been initiated a long time ago, but, but in 2016 we reached the same number of patients as, we, as uh, Europe countries had in the 70s, before the beginning of screening programs in Europe. Uh, that indicates what screening program which we have here is not really working. И основной причиной является низкая мотивация населения. And main reason is uh, uh, low interest from population. И также низкая подготовленность врачей, которые интерпретируют результаты скрининга. And uh, basically uh, staff level, so uh, inter result interpretation is not always easy and can be taken by them. На сегодняшний день лечение рака складывается из uh, системной и локальной терапии. К, систем, к локальной терапии относятся хирургия и лучевая терапия. So we have uh, local and system treatment strategies. Uh, local strategy is uh, surgery and radiation therapy. Uh, но на сегодняшний день локальные методы воздействия достигли своего предела. Они становятся все более совершенными, малоинвазивными. Uh, появляются эндоскопические операции, роботические операции. Uh, лучевая терапия позволяет лечить пациентов, у которых uh, недостижимо опухоли хирургически. Uh, <coughs> so surgeries became less invasive. Uh, we're using laparoscopic uh, surgeries uh, and radiation uh, therapy is used in cases when surgeries cannot be applied. Но зная биологию опухоли, мы понимаем, что радикальное удаление опухоли не спасает пациентов, потому что существуют uh, микрометастазы, которые приводят к генерализации процесса. Uh, but studies in cancer biology are actually showing what uh, uh, primary tumor deletion is not really helping because we're still dealing with meds. И тогда наступает время системной терапии. Системная терапия перешла из роли вспомогательной при хирургии в основную. Uh, that's the time when system uh, therapy steps up. Steps in. Uh, uh, сегодняшний день у нас есть в, в наличии химиотерапии, таргетной терапии, иммунотерапии. И уровень ее настолько высок, что он позволяет даже при четвертой стадии герминогенных опухолей рака яичка и uh, uh, яичника uh, вылечить 80-90% пациентов. So now we are uh, speaking about chemotherapy, targeted therapy and immunotherapy and in some cases the level of therapy is uh, so good what uh, even patients at fourth stage of ovarian cancer can be uh, treated. Однако uh, uh, на сегодняшний день возникла проблема не только в России, но и во всем мире. Это так называемая финансовая токсичность терапии. But uh, here we are dealing with new problem. It's uh, toxicity of the therapy cost. Uh, 
uh, that's a direct translation. I don't know if there is a special sentence for that. Mm -hmm. Эта проблема во всех странах, она не только в России, когда стоимость препарата не позволяет его назначить всем пациентам, которые в нем нуждаются. I believe we have the same problem in all countries, not only in Russia. So the price of the therapy is so high that it cannot be prescribed to all patients. Таким образом получается, что часть пациентов находится в более привилегированном положении, другая часть нет. And here we see the difference between patients. Some of them are getting better care, and second part is not. Таким образом сейчас формируется позиция всех систем здравоохранения, которая направлена на то чтобы назначить эффективное лечение, но адекватное по цене. And new position in healthcare is actually prescribing at доступное лечение, available treatment for for all patients, but medical healthcare can pay for this treatment. It it must be free of pay from patient, of course. Так что у нас есть развивается активно палеотивная помощь, симптоматическая терапия, и основная цель этой терапии создать адекватное обезболивание, чего еще недавно не было. A lot of efforts have been done in palliative therapy, and that is quite recent thing. Before it wasn't used in Russia much. Создаются отделения, создаются хосписы, где пациенты могут улучшить свое качество жизни, несмотря на тяжелое течение болезни. New facilities and hospices have been created and opened for palliative care. Таким образом, для того, чтобы решить существующие проблемы на сегодняшний день в России, необходимо пропагандировать, необходимо подключать СМИ, правительство, пациентские организации для того, чтобы пропагандировать здоровый образ жизни. Uh, coming to the conclusions, first of all, we have to uh, involve mass media to uh, interest uh, population in a healthy lifestyle. Создание полноценного канцер регистра, чтобы мы могли отслеживать, как эффективно лечатся пациенты, как они выживают. Create a cancer register to be able to track down each patient and see the statistics for each patient and population in general. Создание единых национальных стандартов, которые обеспечивали бы на равных условиях всех пациентов одинаковым одинаковым лечением. We have to create a governmental standards which will allow all patients to uh, get the similar treatment and similar care. Обеспечение доступа всех граждан всех регионов к одинаковому лечению, вне зависимости от места проживания. Uh, and allow all uh, habitants to the same care level regardless of the place where they live because I mean Russia is a big country we have big, huge difference between uh, big cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg and smaller villages развитие системы реабилитации пациентам теперь недостаточно выжить они понимают что жить они могут долго они хотят жить хорошо встает вопрос об улучшении качества жизни и здесь приобретает значение реабилитация этих пациентов Patient rehabilitation. So patients understand what now they don't want just to live; they want to live good. And help of the family is not enough, so we have to think about rehabilitation centers. И также развитие палеотивной помощи должно быть на высоте и на уровне, чтобы обеспечить достойное существование пациентов, которые, к сожалению, погибают. Palliative care. So we have to. Allow all patients to to get help, and yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry for my translation. Please, if you have questions, I will try to answer them as well. I mean. Of course, uh, he understands everything, and he can speak uh, probably uh, better than I do. Yeah. In the US, there is a sort of a certain opposite problem. But the problem is overdiagnosis. Uh, there is a, there are actually the methods of diagnostics is so sensitive that doctors 
now see cancer where there is no cancer, especially in breast cancer and in prostate cancer becoming a problem. Do you see this as a problem in Russia as well? Гиперциагностика. А, есть, да, 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 да. Существует такая проблема, потому что э, э, в ходе скрининга выявляются многие формы рака, которые обладают индолентным течением, которые в течение жизни никогда не перейдут в инвазивные формы рака и которые никогда не, ну, пациент не доживет до развития отдаленных метастазов. Это действительно проблема. И первый, кто э, об этом заговорил, это скандинавы, которые первые запустили скрининговые программы, которые стали ста сравнивать эффективность проводимой терапии и средств, затраченных на нее. И тогда они первые стали говорить о том, а стоит ли это того, чтобы этим заниматься. Мы uh, have a similar problem, especially when it comes to the cancer types, which will never become invasive and never will cause the death of a patient. So patient can live with that cancer types for, for many years. And uh, here we are looking at our Scandinavian colleagues who have compared uh, patients who go got treatment with patients who didn't get it and lived with almost similar uh, n number of, uh, of years and compared the price of treatment which we uh, spent в то же время, когда в Соединенных Штатах очень много внимания уделяется скринингу и большому количеству средств выделяется скринингу, в то же время наблюдение за пациентами, которые пролечены по поводу рака и находятся в чекапе, они не проводят каких-либо значимых для нас, во всяком случае, в России исследований, таких как компьютерная томография, ПЭТ-КТ, все сводится к тому, что они проводят пациентам только визуальный контроль и опрос их жалоб. И все остальные исследования назначаются только по жалобам пациентов. Точно? Окей. Здесь, на самом деле, разные проблемы для пациентов, которые были диагностированы... Может, вы сами переведете? Uh, 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 and uh, followed up uh, 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 after uh, after treatment when the patient just come come to doctor and uh, ask him check me please doctor say oh do you have some problem no said patient you have no nothing I just look in your breast or lymph nodes a condition and ultrasound is not necessary uh, CT scan is not necessary only if you have some problem It's prescribed in all uh, guidelines of breast cancer uh, in my specialty. See, you can answer better. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm listening. Could I ask just one question about uh, the drug approval process? In the UK, sometimes drugs can take two or three years to reach approval in the UK that are already approved in the US and throughout Europe. So protocols that are available in other countries are not available in the UK. Is that something similar in Russia, or are drugs available? Ага, препараты, которые одобрены в других странах, они должны пройти одобрение в UK. Это занимает два-три года. We have the same situation in Russia because we have our health organization. We do certification, official registration of uh, some drugs. It's Everywhere, I think this problem is very everywhere. Do you know how long it takes? The, the same period. Two, three two, years. Two, two, three years. Mm -hmm. okay.
Well, good morning. It's really a pleasure for me to be here to share some of our research with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to things, to projects we could do together. I, uh, my laboratory works in uh, cancer and we've been working on two, and developing better animal models for two different types of cancer, kidney cancer and a head and neck cancer. Uh, I, here's a picture of, uh, you've seen a couple of pictures of Weil Cornell, and this is uh, a picture of my lab here and the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Okay. So um, I'll start talking about kidney cancer. Now there are many types of kidney cancer uh, as shown here, and we are focusing, um, wait, we are, whoops, excuse me. We're focusing, sorry, we are focusing primarily on, um, on uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. This is the type of renal cell carcinoma that the majority of patients have, and it's generally associated with a defect in the protein VHL. Now, uh, I work with a clinician, Dr. David Nanis who is interested in developing new treatments for kidney cancer. And he said many years ago there was no good animal model for kidney cancer and we decided we should develop one. So we are using a mouse model and the, we call these mice track mice. It's a transgenic model of uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma at an early stage. And in this model, we, um, we use a, a constitutively active HIF, HIF1-alpha. This is a transcription factor that is highly overexpressed in early stage uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma because of the absence of the tumor suppressor gene VHL. So we develop these track mice, and the track mice very much uh, mimic human uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. For example, uh, we see an increase in a marker called CD31. Also CA9. CA9 is the uh, major marker of human clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And you can see here that we see much higher level of CA9 immunostain in the track mice versus the uh, control mice that are wild type or don't have the trans gene, this constitutively active HIF1 alpha gene. This, uh, this trans gene is only expressed in the kidney proximal tubule cells. So uh, it's a specific model for, for kidney, kidney cancer. We also see higher GLUT1 uh, glucose transporter and also high VEGF expression. So all of these markers mimic very much what occurs in human clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, to show you some of the, the histology, we see disorganized proximal tubules. You can see this here. Um, the tubules are disorganized. We see uh, cystic clear cell carcinoma. Uh, and here you can see um, the early onset of an in situ tumor in track mice fed a high fat diet. So it usually takes several months for these uh, cancerous lesions to develop in the mice, the kidney cancer lesions. But if we put the mice on a high fat diet, we see the lesions develop sooner. And here's an example of one of them developing only in about four months in the mice. Now, uh, obesity is a risk factor for, for humans with clear cell renal cell carcinoma, so this model again reflects what occurs uh, in humans in that a high fat diet making the mice obese le leads to um, earlier development of these lesions. So um, we, this is a good model of early uh, renal cell carcinoma, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, but we wanted to make the model even better. And in humans, there are three tumor suppressor genes 
that are also mutated. So in humans with uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, almost all of them have a VHL inactivation, or inactivation or mutation. Um, but there are also three tumor suppressor genes, SETD2, BAP1, and PBRM, that are uh, mutated in anywhere from 10 to 50 percent of human clear cell renal cell carcinoma patients. So we wanted to mimic this in mice. So what we did um, is to develop a mouse line uh, that will knock out all three of these tumor suppressor genes. So to do this, we um, generated an embryonic stem cell uh, line and then uh, made mice out of this line. And what we did was uh, use um, Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, where we um, put in guide RNAs for BAP1, PBRM1, and SETD2 um, into, into the mice. And then we also um, uh, express Cas9, but only under the control of a tetracycline in, uh, response element. So we can um, turn on the expression of Cas9 when we want with uh, doxycycline. So we made these mice called BPS mice that have these, these um, uh, guide RNAs so that we can then knock out all three of these tumor suppressor genes. And then we had to do a lot of mouse crosses, which we've done. And this has taken probably a couple of years, but we then crossed these, what we call BPS mice, because they have the guide RNAs for the BAP1, PBRM1, and SETD2 gene, genes, these tumor suppressor genes, so that we can knock them out specifically in the kidney. And then we crossed these mice with um, this line with a, a kidney-specific promoter driving the TAT trans, trans, uh, transactivator um, transcription factor. And then we crossed these in with the TRAC mice, our HIF, HIF uh, constitutively active mice. So we've, we now have these mice. It took a while, but we have these BPS GGTA TRAC mice. And we're um, analyzing them now. We're just starting to analyze them. And the idea will be that they will hopefully give us uh, metastatic and more aggressive uh, kidney cancer because of the loss of these tumor, tumor suppressor mutations. So this should even make the model that we have an uh, even better model to model what's going on in human patients. Now, we, so far, we only know with these mice that the, um, that the, um, the, the tumor suppressor genes are being knocked out. So we've done deep sequencing of the mice, and we can, I don't have a slide, but we can show that the tumor suppressor genes are being deleted. And so we're now watching the mice and breeding more mice so that we can uh, see if these mice develop me uh, metastatic uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. But in addition, we are also looking at one of the targets uh, for, um, for uh, clear, a, a new target for clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So when we compared our track mice by RNA-seq a few years ago with um, human <coughs> TCGA data and, and oncomine data, we found that a very interesting gene called NDUFA4L2 was highly overexpressed in our, our track mice. And it's also highly overexpressed anywhere from 40 to 80, 90 fold in human uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Now, this gene, NDUFA4L2, is a mitochondria, encodes a mitochondrial protein and it um, decreases oxygen consumption by inhibiting complex one activity in the mitochondria. So this gene had not been studied much at all. There are only about 12 publications on this gene, and about three of them now are from our lab. But the fact that it's highly overexpressed in 90% or more of human patients suggests that it could be um, an important new target. We'd like to uh, 
inhibit it. So let me show you some of our data. So we, um, whoop, sorry, there. So we, um, we've, we published in 2016 in the journal Clinical Cancer Research, we showed that the trap mice overexpress NDUFA4L2, the RNA level and at the protein level. And only the track mice, these, uh, this tumor model, clear cell, renal cell carcinoma tumor model, overexpresses NDUFA4L2. And it's also expressed only in the uh, tumor kid kidneys and not in other tissues in the mouse. We also showed um, using human kidney cancer cell lines that the um, that if we knock down NDUFA4L2 in human uh, cultured clear cell renal cell carcinoma cells, that this leads to growth uh, proliferation inhibition. So that suggests that the tumor cells are actively overexpressing this protein so that they can grow and suppress oxidative phosphorylation. And if we inhibit that or block that expression of NDUFA4L2, the tumor cells uh, will die or, or become growth uh, inhibited. That's what these data show. And we also um, looked at uh, actual tumor biopsies, tumor samples from patients treated at Weill Cornell. And, you can, and we had their normal controls. Um, so I'm just showing you a little example here. See, in the normal kidney nearby the tumor that was excised from a patient, you don't see any NDUFA4L2 message or protein over here. Uh, but in the tumor sample, you see a lot of NDUFA4L2. And you can see it here that it's highly overexpressed in the, specifically in the human tumors. Um, relating to Dr. Robinson's lovely talk earlier today about uh, some of the work at Weill Cornell, we are also, we are taking advantage of the, um, of uh, growing the, the tumor cells in um, organ culture. Um, and we see NDUFA4L2 overexpression in these, these uh, patient-derived uh, cultures as well in the three-dimensional organ cultures. So we're studying those, we can take the cells directly from patients and we're actually working with uh, the, the team in terms of looking at RNA-seq and exome sequencing in these uh, patient-derived cells. These samples were taken directly from a, a sample from a, a patient and studied. Um, along with Dr. Mongan, we showed that, um, that ND, NDUFA4, so it's highly expressed in almost all patient tumors, but if it's even more expressed, greater than 90-fold overexpression at the mRNA level. The patients shown here have a worse prognos prognosis than if it's overexpressed, but to a lesser degree, as you can see here. So this is uh, some, this is um, patient outcome data or survival data. So we're very interested in this, um, this particular target and in, in developing inhibitors for this target. It um, appears to have been somewhat ignored by the other researchers working in kidney cancer. So again, to um, test this, uh, to study this protein further in a mouse model, we've done, we have another mouse model now where we've um, generated a, a doxycycline regulated, so we can either turn this on or off, um, a kidney proximal tubule cell specific um, uh, construct so that we can knock down NDUFA4L2 um, specifically in the kidney proximal tubule cells. So you can see here we have um, the tr TAT transactivator protein. When it's bound to the TRE promoter, it will not uh, lower um, NDUFA4L2 expression because of this shRNA. Um, and if we add doxycycline, we can block that. And we, we now have these mice as well. We've just gotten them recently. And you can see over here that um, here's the, this is just an actin loading control. Uh, this is a Western blot. And um, when, we, um, at, when we turn 
when we um, activate the shRNA for NDUFA4L2, we see much less NDUFA4L2 protein here than we do in the track mice. Of course, the wild type mice, the kidneys, don't express the NDUFA4L2, as I said before. We also have the EGFP as a marker, so that should be expressed along with the shRNA. So the point of this is to um, maximize the use of the mouse models and make the mouse models for kidney cancer as close as possible to the human, human um, markers and the human condition, the human disease. And we can also study the, the NDUFA4L2, this new target in kidney cancer, in the context of a mouse where we can look at immunotherapy, we can look at, it's a, these are not immunocompromised, these are not xenograft, this is a mouse with a normal immune system so we can look at, um, at um, drug therapies and, and study further the role of NDUFA4L2 in, um, in um, kidney cancer development. And I wanted to just show you the people involved in this work. I'm going to talk about head and neck cancer next, but Dr. N David Nanis has been um, one of the uh, key players here. He is the head of all of the um, clinical oncology for Weill Cornell and New York Presbyterian Hospital, and he's been a close collaborator of mine for about 15 years. He um, would have liked to have come to this meeting, but he has two daughters, both of whom were pregnant and due this month, and one of them just had a baby last week, so he did not want to travel because he's being a good, a good grandfather. <laughs> he's very excited about the births, but he hopefully would like to come another, at, on another time to this. He'd love to visit, visit uh, Russia. And then these, Dr. Lei Ping Fu and Denise Minton were involved in this work as well as not shown, Dr. Uh, Christian Larson, uh, uh, Johannes Vonderman, he's a, a clinical fellow working with me and Dr. Nanis from the Netherlands, Dr. Lucas Dow, uh, Maria Shevchuk, Francesca Kani, and Brian Robinson from the pathology department, Dr. Grossen Chen from the pharmacology department, and Dr. Mongan from the University of Nottingham. So that um, summarizes what we're doing right now in the Kidney Cancer Project. And now I'll move on to talk briefly about our head and neck cancer models and what we're doing there. Again, we work closely <coughs> with clinical colleagues. My view is that these models um, are important, but they're only important if they reflect what is going on in the human disease well. So we um, are constantly getting input from our clinical colleagues so uh, with regard to head and neck cancer, um, in the United States, there are 60,000 new cases, and there, in, in, there were in 2017. Of course, smoking and alcohol are major risk factors for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this has, of course, been studied by the TCGA and other cancer consortia, and there are known different uh, tumor suppressor and tumor acti uh, activation mutations. Right now, there's no cancer prevention or early detection available for high-risk patients. So um, this, this area is a really important area, head and neck cancer, for developing good models and developing uh, markers and, and so that patients at high risk can be studied. So we, we've developed a murine model of head and neck and esophageal squamous cell carcinoma that reflects human carcinogenesis. This model is focused on mutations related to smoking and alcohol use more than um, HPV. We're not um, so focused on, on that, uh, that uh, type of head and neck cancer. So the model we use for head and neck cancer is a carcinogen model. And we add uh, a carcinogen that is a surrogate for smoking. It makes similar types of mutations, but it's uh, water soluble. So the carcinogen is 4-nitroquinoline oxide. And this is a very aggressive uh, tumor model in that 100% of the mice develop tumors. So what we do is we treat the mice with foreign QO for a number of weeks and then we stop and we wait and about 10 to 15 weeks later um, there are large tumors in the mouth um, and the esophagus. So we can um, 
ask what happens, we add the carcinogen, then we can ask what happens after we take away the carcinogen. When we take away the, after 10 weeks, we don't see tumors here, but obviously there are some initial events, and then um, over time the tumors develop. Uh, the tumors develop very similar, to, similarly to the tumors in humans. We see hyperplasias, dysplasias, um, severe dysplasias and carcinomas in C2, and then invasive squamous cell carcinomas in this model. This model that we developed, we published first in clinical cancer research a number of years ago, and it's now very widely used. There are um, many, many labs, and uh, this paper has been cited hundreds of times because uh, it's a, a useful model, and it does reflect what occurs in humans. So I'll tell you about two studies we're doing with this model. The first involves looking at stem cells in the, head, in the oral cavity and how they develop into tumors. I think this is a very important area and not as well studied. And then I'll talk about some therapeutic work that we've done. So what we do to study stem cells is we use, again, the mice, but we do lineage tracing studies. So what does that mean? We use a promoter that is active in stem cells in the tongue and the esophagus. So in the basal layer, the, there are stem cells that are long-term stem cells that keep this, this epithelial tissue going over time in adults, uh, keep it alive. And so we, we can mark um, the stem cells by using this truncated K14 promoter driving Cree-ERT. So this is a estrogen, uh, tamoxifen responsive Cree. And we cross this with what we call Rosa laxi mice. So when we um, treat only, we treat with tamoxifen for just two days, and what will happen there is that this, um, this uh, there's a, a, a region of DNA between this actin rosa promoter and the lax Z gene. So when we treat with tamoxifen, this region will, of DNA will be cut out, and then the lax Z gene will be brought close to the promoter, and the lax Z gene from then on will be always on, so we can measure beta-galactosidase activity. So the idea here is that we can mark the long-term stem cells before we treat with carcinogen and then look at what happens. Um, so let's see what happens. I have a little bit of data. We found something very, very interesting. So when we, if we just look at control tongues, so remember the cells are being marked um, early in the mouse, and so every little blue dot you see is a stem cell. And we use a low dose of tamoxifen, so we're only looking at a few stem cells. If we use a really high dose, we'd mark all the stem cells, and we wouldn't be able to trace the lineage of one stem cell. But we're able to do this by um, using a low dose of tamoxifen. And what we see, sorry, is um, if, we ju ju if we don't treat with carcinogen, the control mice, up to 46, a year later, we see these tiny little dots of blue. This is, I should explain, this is a whole map of a tongue. So this is a mouse tongue. And you see that here, um, even after 46 weeks, we see that one stem cell is dividing, and if we look carefully, it's dividing asymmetrically and then the daughter cells are moving up the epithelium. This is a, a squamous um, epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium. So they're moving up um, in the tongue. This is the muscle area, and here's the epithelial cells. But if we treat with carcinogen, we see something very different. We see fewer of these little blue dots indicating stem cells, but we see um, large patches of blue that come from one stem cell. For example, here is one in the section, and here's another. So, um, and that's all uh, quantitated here. I won't take the time to go in this. This was published in the journal Carcinogenesis in 2013. But let me tell you what we, let me give you a model for what we think is happening. So, in the normal condition without a carcinogen, uh, each of these cells here is acting as a long-term stem cell, but we're only labeling um, the blue cell. We're only labeling a few of them because 
we're, we're doing lineage tracing. But we see primarily asymmetric cell division. So this stem cell is dividing and the daughter cells move on up and eventually there's um, uh, apoptosis and the top layer of the cells of course are enucleated and they, they die. So the, primarily it's asymmetric cell division. But if we um, treat with the carcinogen, the 4NQO treated cells, um, we see uh, now symmetric division of the stem cells. So some of the stem cells die, but then other stem cells, like let's take this stem cell here, it now divided symmetrically, and then this, this stem, these two st stem cells that came from one cell, they then they will then later do carry out asymmetric, asymmetric division. But the idea here is that the um, stem cell population in tumor-treated mice becomes less diverse. So more cells in the epithelium are coming from one stem cell after carcinogen treatment. So what are the implications of this? Well, what, 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 do, what are our conclusions from this lineage tracing analysis where we can follow what happens early during carcinogenesis and watch what happens to the stem cells? We see these large um, X-gal blue clones or cell cultures and they're likely, um, they're derived from one stem or progenitor cell. They arise in foreign QO treated but not in untreated mice. I showed you that. So, 4NQO, um, we've, we've shown um, after the carcinogen treatment, shortly after, it causes some death of the progenitor cells. And we see a shift. We can actually see the blue cells, a, a shift from asymmetric to symmetric division of the stem progenitor cells. And then um, the 4NQO carcinogen treatment results in, um, uh, the treatment results in a reduction uh, in the diversity of the stem progenitor cell population with potentially dire consequences. Because then if, if more cells in the tongue are coming from just a lower number of stem cells, then if one of those stem cells has a mutation, develops a mutation, then, and, and now it's, it's spread by symmetric division, so now all the cells in that, clump, that patch, those blue patches, come from one stem cell, then all of those cells are more likely to develop, uh, to, to potentially develop cancer. So this um, type of behavior of the stem cells could lead to, could explain what occurs in the, the term field cancerization. So patients with head and neck cancer um, are prone to getting second primaries. Often even if one uh, tumor is, is treated surgically, the whole mouth area and esophagus are more prone to cancer. And this um, behavior of stem cells could help explain this. So um, in the last couple of minutes, I want to just share with you some of our, um, our data on some treatment in this model, some, can uh, tr some uh, cancer preventive agents. So for, for this, uh, we used a, a retinoid, a retinoic acid um, <coughs> synthetic uh, compound. <coughs> And, and we, we chose an RAR gamma agonist because um, uh, David Lones, who worked with Pierre Chambon, showed many years ago that the retinoic acid receptor gamma can act as a tumor suppressor in, in skin cancer models. So we used an RAR gamma agonist as well as a drug called bexerotine that is a, an FDA-approved synthetic retinoid used in T-cell cutaneous T cell lymphoma treatment. We added them together. And what we did was um, treat the mice, this is just wild type mice now, with 4NQO, the carcinogen. We stopped the treatment. And then here we either gave the, we, we, we had some mice that um, continued without any drug treatment. Other mice were given um, the RAR gamma agonist or, and or bexerotine. Um, this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2014, our results. And what we found was that there were fewer tumors. So, of course, untreated mice, shown here, don't get any tumors. But the carcinogen-treated mice had more tumors on the tongue. 
and they also um, had more severe tumors. And when we treated with the carcinogen plus bexarotene plus CD1530, we saw a reduction in the number and the severity of the tumors. Remember, this is a very aggressive model, so 100% of the mice developed multiple tumors, but we were able, with, with just the 4-NQO treatment, but we were able to decrease the number of tumors using this drug combination. We also looked at markers and I, w I won't go through all of these, but a number of these markers are um, known to be upregulated at the mRNA level in human head and neck cancer patients. For example, HIF-1, alpha, GLUT-1, MCT-4, this is a, tr a transporter, MMP-3, this is a um, protease, and MMP-9. Those MMP-3 and MMP-9 are strong markers of when they're overexpressed in human cancer. And again, you can see that by our RNA-seq data, untreated mice have low, I'll just show you an example here, have um, very low levels of MMP3 and MMP9, but in the 4NQO treated, we see much higher levels, and then with the drug treatments, the, the levels are lower. So this suggests that these two drugs in combination could be used in a chemo-preventive setting in terms of, um, uh, for example, patients with, that are uh, smoker, smokers or, or smoking and drinking and are at high risk or, of head and neck cancer. So um, what to summarize this head and neck model data, we have the murine model that mimics gene expression changes and the histological changes of human head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. We see major reductions in tumor formation with bexarotene and this RAR gamma agonist, CD1530. Both the number and sizes of the lesions are reduced. Um, bexarotene and the CD1530 normalize the gene expression in our carcinogen-treated mice. And then um, they showed a, the, the, the drug-treated mice also showed a reduction in oxidative stress that may be associated with the reduction in tumorigenesis. I didn't show you that data. And I just want to point out that, um, <clears throat> that while Cornell was interested in this uh, idea as well, so while Cornell has filed IP related to this project, and uh, myself and Dr. Tang, who works with me on this project, are inventors on this technology, so it's important to acknowledge this fact as well. So um, I'd like to thank the people who are involved in this project as well. So Dr. Shaohan Tang is a faculty member in our department, works with me. And this was, I, he doesn't always look like this in the lab. We have a lot of fun in addition to doing science in the lab. And uh, I wanted to show you a couple pictures. But Dr., this is our Halloween party. We have a Halloween party every year where we introduce the graduate students and they have to dress up. and competition to see if they can beat the graduate students, have better costumes than the students from the previous year. So this was a, our, our mouse team dressed as a, a different mouse, Mighty Mouse and Mickey Mouse. And so, but Dr. Tang does wonderful work and he is a professional scientist. <laughs> and then this is from 2016, some of my lab members, and I put this here in part to show that Dr. Ni Dr. Nigel Mangan gets out of the lab too, and here he was visiting us in the summer and uh, doing some work, collaborative work, and we were on a beautiful hike in a, in a, a lovely area near uh, New York City. And I, I also included this picture from this year um, where we went jet skiing along the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And this is my current, these are my current lab members. And I want to thank um, also, Dr. Teresa Scognamiglio, she is our pathologist. She's worked with us for about uh, 12 years, 15 years on this head and neck cancer project. She's also in the pathology, she's in the pathology department at Weill Cornell. And Dr. Cutler, who is a, a head and neck surgeon, and he provides many, many samples to us for met, looking at uh, markers and um, we're doing RNA-seq on human head and neck cancer patients too, and so he, he is a very um, uh, valued collaborator. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions, and here's a picture of New York City, and 
Wow, Cornell's right over here somewhere. So thank you very much. A uh, couple of questions. This uh, floor and your model. Mm -hmm. uh, did you study what kind of actually genetic mutations it causes and whether it's uh, relevant to what you see in patients? And uh, also, as a follow up, yeah. uh, in uh, your mouse model, uh, did you study heterogeneity of the tumors and whether uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, evolution or if there is a driving mutation which causes additional mutations within the uh, Tumor uh, generating some kind of genetic heterogeneity? Um, yes, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm just going to go back to um, this slide for a second because um, your question is relevant to a grant that we received, a big grant from the National Cancer Institute a couple of years ago to do just that. So we're doing that. And some of the initial mutations we see, do, we see uh, by exome sequencing do correspond to what, what occur in the types of mutations that occur in humans. But we're also finding some other, so we're doing it a little bit, maybe we're doing it a little bit differently than um, what some other people are doing. So we're taking these, let me, I'm pointing here, let me just, we're taking, um, these, uh, these stem cells here, like we're taking a big clone like this where there's expansion, growth, more growth, and a small clone like this. And we're, we're take, taking, um, cutting the, the DNA from those clones and then doing exome sequencing on those. And we, then we can see the blue cells in the tumors as well. So we're, we're following what happens in the stem cells as the, some of them probably developed mutations earlier and therefore, you know, made these bigger clones. And so we're looking at the mutations that occur in these larger clones versus smaller versus the tumors. And that, we're actually doing that now. But you're doing so, it in mass, right? Uh, the total you, within these, within the these cell? blue, within the blue uh, clones we're taking the, the, well, the mass isn't that big in a mouse tumor, but yeah, we're not doing single cell. We could at some point, but we're not there yet. We could do that. We, as, as Dr. Robinson talked about, we're thinking about doing single cell um, RNA seq, but you know, we just aren't doing it yet. We figured that we should. I think instead of taking regions within one clone, one of those blue clones were. Um, taking clones that have a more expansive ability versus those that didn't expand as much and asking what are the differences there. So it's related to your question, but we, we haven't uh, fully addressed this yet. From a technical point of view, yeah. you could even uh, uh, sort the cells on the human. And then uh, even like, uh, from the whole tongue and try, and if you do the library in single cell uh, sequencing, Technically, you would try to trace, uh, well, first of all, determine the proportion of different uh, cells, like small colony, large right, colony, right. and then within the, with, uh, this uh, populations, uh, try to see the evolution. Uh, right. No, that would be a good idea, too, and we haven't done that. We did have a small project with. Um, we still have it, but she moved. Our former dean was is a woman named Lori Glimpshire. She's now the uh, president of Dana Farber Cancer Institute. She was interested in this model, but she's an immunologist, and she wanted to look at the types of immune cells that move in during the carcinogenesis process. So she did some cell sorting, but only of the she was only focused on the different types of immune cells, you know, the myeloid derived suppressor cells and other types of cells, and not so much on the actual tumor cells. So. And again, just small uh, question: uh, Did you you added a small concentration, uh, so just a few stem cells were labeled? That's right. But uh, uh, have you tried to analyze unlabeled? Uh, columns uh, to see if they actually 
as a res uh, result of the mutation of the stem cell, or maybe there are some parallel mechanisms of tumor genesis? Right, so that's a very good question, too. We haven't done that yet, but it's uh, something we'd like to do. So. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? I have a question for Alan. Um, in your renal cell carcinoma model, have you had a chance to investigate the metabolic impact of inhibiting the mitochondrial complex 1? Um, to, uh, to if we inhibit or knock down the, the um, NDUFA4L2 and look at the metabolic impact, yes, we have. I didn't, um, we've actually published a paper on this um, a couple of years ago, and uh, we see um, more glycolysis and more glycolytic genes. It's very much like the, the model really reflects what happens in, 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 in human cancer. When um, excuse me, when when NDUFA4 is high, and then when we knock it down, we see uh, changes, of course, both in gene expression and the metabolic pattern changes. But we, but um, I didn't really want to go into all the details of that in this talk. Is too too much. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Elena, and I'm going to talk about uh, cancer genomic studies in uh, our republic. Actually, I don't like the title of this talk, so I'll just keep this slide. Okay. Uh, we all know that cancer cells may arise in many organs, in many tissues, and from many, many ages ago, we developed this classification based on uh, affected organ, right? So we get, got this groups of people with lung cancer, with pancreatic cancer, liver, colon, kidney, head, neck cancer, whatever cancer, based on uh, organ affected. But uh, uh, several years ago, or decades of years, we no, we, from some point, we started to get a lot of knowledge about uh, molecular characteristics of cancer. All these cancers might be uh, genetically profiled now. This means on every, you know, on DNA level, on RNA level, metabolic level, whatever level we can do now. And actually now all omics studies are applied to different, different uh, tumors. And now all these people actually we can divide based on uh, genetics. So and in the same group we can get uh, cancers which affect different organs, but based on their genetics. And, well, the most <coughs> common example of it is uh, lung cancer with EGFR mutations. So we know that patients with uh, EGFR positive lung cancer can benefit from uh, ERESA treatment. And at the same time, uh, EGFR negative patients have no benefit of it. And when we talk about this, this concerns about uh, tumor tissue. So meaning that uh, tumor, tumor tissue profile, genomic or transcriptomic, metabolic, whatever, is different from healthy tissues. And at the same time, now we know that there are uh, germline mutations. So 
this uh, somatic, we, we, we can talk about somatic profiling, but at the same time, we know that some genes have variants which uh, may uh, cause the cancer. So this is a cancer predisposition genes, and they are inherited from our parents. Uh, and uh, both uh, germ-based uh, germline mutations and uh, somatic mutations uh, uh, have to be included, included in the decision of doctors. So uh, chemotherapy might be based on the molecular profile of patients or cancer tissue. And the most, of course, well-studied example of germline mutation is uh, BRCA genes or Angelina Jolie genes. We know that uh, some variants, some pathogenic variants of these genes uh, increase the development of cancer risk significantly. So in case of uh, breast cancer, cancer, you get 50% of probability that uh, carrier will get breast cancer by 50 years old, and this probability is more than 80% by 70 years old. This is a most studied, one of the most studied genes in the last decades. And many, many countries started to study these genes to know which actually variants are most common in their region. Uh, so they have started this population-based study, and we know like very famous three uh, uh, Ashkenazian Jewish alleles, uh, which are, uh, called, which are called founder mutations and which are the most common in uh, the area. So many, many countries have started to do this population study. And uh, in Russia, uh, uh, from several years ago, I think some labs have started to do even earlier, uh, they perform PCR-based typing, so they have these uh, most commonly six variants in BRCA1 genes. It can vary from lab from eight, I think, to uh, from four to eight variants. So they routinely type for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer patients, for HUBOC patients. And uh, if you look to Russian literature, we can see that up to 94% of variants might be uh, hereditary HBOC patients might be explained by the mutation in BRCA1 gene. So, sounds cool, uh, but once we met with uh, doctors from our Tatarstan Cancer Center and they talk, uh, told us about the problem, so they made a pilot study and among uh, 280 patients hereditary breast and ovarian cancer patients, so means they having early age breast cancer or bilateral breast cancer, having severe family history, and all these uh, criteria included, they have only seven positive cases. And it gives only 2.5%. So actually only 2.5% of HBOC patients could be explained by the presence of BRC, these BRC mutations. And they said, something strange about this, and uh, why? Why is it so? Uh, maybe in our republic there is a different frequency of pathogenic mutations, or there are different uh, founder mutations, different genes, or in the same genes but different position. We didn't know, so actually we gathered together, all of us, and decided to start a pilot project. So uh, this is our main people in. Uh, who is in this project. So this is a doctor from our Tatarstan Cancer Center. He's actually started the project. Uh, Dr. Alexei Nikitin, he is uh, uh, doing all bioinformatics. And this is my boss, and we are doing all that part. So what we did in the beginning, we started, OK, we do pilot project. And we took all like, you know, the most severe cases. So they were negative for these founder alleles from this panel. And we thought, what, what are we going to do with them? Maybe we should go for exome sequencing. But at that mo moment, we actually had very small budget, so we could not afford. And then we decided to go for the panel sequencing. And uh, 
Uh, we made our custom panel, including mostly uh, genes from uh, DNA repair pathway and some genes which are known to be linked to hereditary cancers. So we took this custom panel and this is a uh, first results from this. This is only results for HBOP patients, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer patients. So this is a boring table, but showing that we have uh, more than 750 patients and you see that 30% uh, of them had very early disease onset. What we did, we also asked patients if they had um, family history. It's one of the inclusion criteria. And you see that also 30% of uh, patients, at least in case of breast cancer, they had uh, very close relatives, mother, daughter, or sister, suffering from the same cancer type. We also asked about other uh, cancers, if some uh, relatives were affected with other types of cancers, and uh, so many of them had relatives. And uh, the majority of these cases, so I didn't put it on slide, but it's stomach cancer or, or esophagus cancer or colon cancer, sometimes some other types of cancers, but this is uh, most commonly present in these cases. So we took these patients and um, we used nimble gen panel for uh, gene enrichment and uh, then sequencing on my sick. And as a result, what we have got, a little bit more than quarter of our cases could be explained by BRCA mutations. One third could be explained by mutation in one of other genes. Of course, we still have some, uh, too many cases which might not be explained by one of the mutations in one of these genes. But of course, we have restrictions, and GS cannot detect uh, large chair arrangements or um, if the mutation takes place in uh, a regulatory part of the gene or it's in gene not included in the panel. But still, now, the percent of cases is much more, remember, like when they said 96 samples, 96% uh, of cases only BRCA1 genes. And remember, it's only 2, 3% of all cases. So the situation is actually very different. Uh, if you go a little bit closer, so we get the majority of mutation in BRCA1 gene is exon 10 and 12. This is small exons. And then BRCA2 gene, uh, two gene the majority of mutation is 10 and 11 exons. Of course, this is a big and important exons, having important domains. But you see, 10% of cases actually was explained by pathogenic mutation in the very last small exon. So, sometimes considered not so important, maybe cannot affect, but still 10% of cases is affected. So if we get closer look to this part, other genes, we quite often see mutations in ATM, CDH1, APC, CHEP2, fancy genes, all these genes. Uh, of course, if we look at these genes separately, it's not that big amount of patients, but altogether, there are more than a half of cases. So meaning this is very important. And many, majority of these genes are actually clinically actionable. So according to NCCN guidelines, you can treat these patients in different way. And meaning this, is, this knowledge is also very important, the same as BRCA1 or 2 genes. Uh, from another point of view, now we can approach healthy carriers. All patients, of course we go with uh, already cancer-affected patients, but they have all, they, all of them have relatives, the daughters, the sisters, they still healthy, but they might be carriers. And they benefit from this knowledge if they know that they are a carrier, uh, they can you know, do something either to prevent or either to, in case cancer happens, to find it an early stage. So it's considered to be beneficial. So it's a field to develop genetic counseling in Republic. Mm. And one example, 
of unexpected finding. We detected a germline splicing mutation in CDK12 gene. So this mutation is novel. It was not present in any database. And uh, in the beginning, we got first case like that, second case with this mutation, and we thought, mm, okay, we, don't, we still don't know if it's pathogenic or not. It's not present in ClinVar or RGMD databases. Not, but not other, no database describes this as that this is a pathogenic mutation in this okay. I don't know, what shall we tell to doctor? Uh, and another problem is uh, we do not have um, Russian exact. We, unfortunately, there were no population-based study in Russia, not in our region, in, in, not in our region, in any other regions. We don't have, we don't know. Maybe it's normal polymorphism, which is characteristics for people from our region. So we, all, we did a uh, like small study. We picked up four patients, already breast and ovarian cancer patients and healthy control. And um, we checked it only for this mutation and we get uh, odds ratio of 40% is quite big. So now we have, we are more, like we have, we think that yes, this mutation might be actually novel, uh, pathogenic mutations. We are still a little bit cautious about it. Uh, we are going to perform, since it's splicing mutation, it may be tracked by uh, RNA-seq. We are going to do that to actually check if it's really pathogenic. But so many cases like that, because we, we never performed populations-based study. No exact study, no uh, cancer related studies on this on genomic level. So now we started from the single center, from our Tatarstan Cancer Center, and now uh, some other hospitals also joined the project. Now we are getting samples from 21 regions of Russia, so they all send us samples to Kazan. And uh, that's the way how we communicate. So all these cancer hospitals send the blood from hereditary cancer cases to our Tatarstan Cancer Center because there is a clinical genetic lab there. Uh, then they give us uh, samples of blood and we do all that part, uh, mapping and variant calling, and then give back genetic data. And then uh, genetic, the doctor here, inform provide genetic information to hospitals and so they can uh, treat patients in a better way. We hope that it will grow. Now we have we developed our local database. It's written here 1,300 1, cases. Now it's more than uh, 1,500 cases. Now we also include not only breast and ovarian cancer patients, we also get colon, esophagus, stomach cancer. So any hereditary cancer which doctors may find, now we are ready to include. We still have a lot of variants which we are not sure if it's VUS or a variant of unknown significance or pathogenic, likely pathogenic. But we hope when we develop our database up to you know, 5,000, we will be more confident in our data and of course we want to have healthy control. This is our next goal. So to conclude, what we found, this was a fun project for us actually, very small. <laughs> we wanted to do very small but it grew up so big now. More than 50% of cases are caused by mutation in non-BRC genes. This is important. Doctors have to know it, doctors want to know it and use this information. And now, with the decrease of sequencing cost, NGS is the best and the only proper diagnostic tool for hereditary cancer syndromes in Russia, at least at this point. I think it's going to be like that because cost is actually decreasing so much. What we need, we urgently need to develop Russian exact to have healthy control from different, different regions to have not only Slavic people like, like Central Russia. And uh, now we are aiming to develop, it's not really us, it's doctors. 
have to develop this genetic counseling for healthy carriers of pathogenic mutations. And these are people in, involved in the study. So I already showed the Marat, he is the leader of this project. My boss from Kazan University, he is also uh, group leader at Riken uh, in Japan. Uh, Alexei Nikitin, he's doing all bioinformatics, and this is my PhD student. She's doing a lot of libraries, a lot of work is on her. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you mean that uh, uh, in right. several genes it might be, yeah, yeah sure, we yeah. see such cases, I just didn't show the statistics, okay. but yeah, sure, cool. maybe 5% of cases we do have multiple mutations. And then related to that, it's interesting that some 285 of your cases, you have no mutations in your panel. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, um, how do you think about taking that forward? But I think all such studies have approximately 30 to 40 percent which we can say they cannot find the mutations. Right. So it's actually normal. Yeah. But as I told, uh, only exon part of genes are included, yeah. except BRC1 and 2 genes. So all the other genes, only exon part. So of course there are mutations in regulatory parts, in promoters. Yeah. Now we know it. but. We still don't know how to, if it's pathogenic or not, it's so much work. Yeah. And uh, large arrangements, of course. Sometimes we see a really severe case, like, oh, I don't know, family history is so bad, and uh, early breast cancer or bilateral breast cancer, and we cannot find anything. So, I don't know, either they like sun or <laughs> something, or they do have like large rearrangements, which cannot be picked up by NGS. To do exome, genome, even genome is better. Sure. But it was nice to see panel one, which Dr. Good has mentioned yeah. that panel as well. Okay, well that concludes our morning session. I think there's a coffee break now. Thank you again, Eleven. На английский не переключили. Here you go. Hi, so as Nigel said, I'm Corinne, um, and I'm looking at RNA modification M6A within androgen estrogen signaling. Um, I'm working on this alongside another PhD student, Daisy Hay, um, Jenny J. Applin, Veronica Metzler, and also um, Natalia Blatt, um, who works with Albert, has also contributed to this work. So I'm going to give an overview, overview of the M6A, um, and also the background to the project, how it came about and um, steroid hormone signaling. And then I'll also um, sort of overview the findings from the lab so far. So um, like DNA, there's a lot of RNA modifications with the most abundant within mRNA um, being N6 methyl methyladenosine, um, which is known as M6A. So it's evolutionally conserved amongst many eukaryotes and it's been known for around 50 years 
um, but the research was sort of halted for a while because um, there was an inability to actually um, find the methylation site within transcripts um, and it was also thought to be static because there was there was no characterization of any demethylase, demethylase proteins um, but now since the discovery of those um, it's been shown to be dynamic which increased the interest and the research on the subject so the modification is catalyzed through um, a methyl transferase complex with the um, catalytic unit of this being metal 3. There's two characterized arrays of proteins which demethylate the M6A mark, FTO and RBH5, and there's a number of reader proteins um, which help interpret the mark. It's been, to be sh it's been shown to be implicated in a number of biological processes, including RNA translation, stability, and alternative splicing. And due to its role in these biological processes, it's been shown to be implicated in a number of cancers. So the first indication um, from results from within our lab um, showed that metal three is involved in splicing. So the well-characterized Drosophila um, sex determination model was used um, and the homologue of metal 3 in Drosophila is IME4. And so when these, um, so IME4 was knocked down in um, this model, it was shown that there was um, a change in phenotype. So the females um, via qPCR was shown that there's um, the, the male um, splicing form of SXL sex lethal determination gene um, in the, within the females. Um, so then RNA sequencing was undertaken. However, the analysis didn't show a difference within the SXL sex determination gene. Um, so a Shishima plot was um, illustrated that there is a reduction in the female um, splice, splicing um, within the female um, models and so specialised splice analysis of the RNA se sequencing had to be conducted which showed that there was a difference on splicing when the IME4 was null within these models. So this indicates that there could be a role of metal 3 or M6A um, within splicing and that it's required for the correct splicing of the female phenotype. So the hormone signaling, um, so the steroid hormone enters the cell it binds to its receptor and then translocates the nucleus where it binds the hormone receptor element and initiates transcription. And this is required for normal reproductive de development. However, it's also been implicated in the development and progression of endocrine related cancers such as prostate and breast cancer. However, it's often overlooked that there has been research showing that the steroid hormone receptors um, also can regulate alternative splicing. <coughs> so as I've already said, the um, steroid hormones such as androgens can drive prostate carcinogenesis. And so the initial treatment is to use androgen deprivation therapy, which blocks um, androgen receptor and the other production of androgens. Um, however, it has been shown that after around 24 months of treatment, resistance emerges, and this happens through a number of mechanisms, um, such as the emergence of splice variants of the androgen receptor, such as ARV7 here. And so our hypothesis is that M6A factors um, contribute to, could contribute to the alternative splicing of the androgen receptor, which could then contribute to 
the ARV7 emergence and treatment resistance. So the aims of all of our projects um, is to look for a functional interaction between the M6A factors and the androgen and estrogen receptor and their signaling in prostate and breast cancer and, to, to, and then further to determine if the M6A factors um, have an impact on global and androgen receptor regulator splicing. So investigating the Cancer Genome Atlas, we found that in biochemical re recurrence, uh, metal 3 significantly, significantly um, expressed, high, expressed highly in um, biochemical recurrence, and then with FTO and RBH5, they are increased, but this wasn't significant. And we can also show, we've also shown through um, TMAs, which um, have been um, provided by Brian, and stained by Jenny in Sweden, um, that metal 3 and FTO are expressed within these um, clinical samples. Um, so they, we are currently undergoing scoring and we will then um, have, do cor correlations against the clinical um, attributes. So we have shown that metal 3 is expressed across a number of prostate cancer cell lines and with the mRNA level shown to be increased compared to the non-malignant PNT1A cell line. So interestingly for our studies we've shown that in between the non-malignant PNT1A cell line and C42 prostate cancer cell line um, when metal 3 is increased there's an androgen induced um, metal 3 seems to also increase the androgen induction of PSA so following on from this two um, SHRNA guides um, were designed for metal 3 which have been tested in both LNK and C42 and this shows that when metal 3 is knocked down um, it attenuates the androgen induction of PSA so you can see here that we've confirmed the knockdown both on the protein level and on the mRNA level and these samples have now been sent off for RNA sequencing The basal expression of both RBH5 and FTO demethylase proteins have been investigated across a number of prostate cancer cell lines, which have also shown to be increased compared to the non-malignant cell line. We've, conduct we've conducted a number of dual luciferase report assays in which we have transfected in um, steroid hormone receptors with ligand um, with or without FTO or LBH5 to see if it has an effect on nuclear receptor mediated transactivation. And so we found that on the androgen receptor, um, out both LBH5 and FTO suppress the androgen induced transactivation very significantly. and in preliminary results that have been conducted on the estrogen receptor, um, it shows that it also attenuates the estrogen-induced transactivation here. Investigation on the C-bio portal has shown that both RBH5 and FTO mutations um, are seen in a number of prostate and breast cancers here which suggests that it might have a role on the development of the cancer. So we are currently um, scoring a number of TMAs, um, as I already said, and we hope to then stain a number of other cohorts, for example, um, breast cancer TMAs, 
for the M6 factors we, which we're working on. Um, and as there's clinical data available for these, we're going to be able to correlate with clinical outcome. So to conclude, um, M6A has been shown to have a number of implications in varying cancers. And so if these factors um, can be targeted, it might be a potential therapeutic target. And we've identified the role of the of metal-3 in androgen regulator transactivation and data that suggests that ALPH5 and FTO suppress androgen estrogen signaling. And so interdisciplinary training for trainees is very important um, because it leads to successful learning and I've had the great opportunity of coming to this meeting and present the work and also a previous meeting in Sweden and I look forward to working with you in the future. And these are all the people I'd like to thank for their contribution to my book. Thank Thanks. knockout um, will be designed next um, to sort of confirm the functional role and phenotype when I'll be at five minutes till knocked out. SHRNA or yeah, for the for the uh, gene, for example, uh, like to stop the expression of it. Usually before moving to CRISPR, maybe we try yeah. to use the science using RNA to uh, maybe just like, evaluate or investigate if, uh, if we will have any quite good results and then we move to the, the entire knockout. Okay, so is that what you would do yeah. first? No, Okay, no, we haven't considered that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that sounds interesting. Great, really good job. Thanks. Um, how was it treated by your results showing the LN cup uh, expression of this protein sometimes was very increased compared to the normal supply? Yeah. Well, the yeah. Ellen Cap cell line is androgen sensitive, so if the M6A factors obviously do play a role in androgen signaling, the fact that it's you see such an increase could obviously suggest that further. If there are no other questions, I will thank Corinne for your talk. Thank you. Thanks. So my talk is uh, not as sophisticated as the other elegant models that we've heard earlier. Um, it's, oops. This project is focused on uh, target identification and validation of the biochemistry of a potential new way of treating aggressive prostate cancer. And I'm here presenting on behalf of uh, Jenny Jayapalan, uh, one of our senior postdocs who unfortunately could not be here uh, as, as she's now pregnant, <laughs> but she had hoped to, to, to meet with you. Uh, and I have no relevant conflicts of interest to declare for this project. Um, I'm very fortunate that all of the work in the lab is done by extremely talented and highly motivated and extremely hardworking people. Uh, and it's always good to have a name for a face. So Jenny is leading this project and it's taken forward some work that Veronica, a postgraduate student, has been doing for the last three years. 
and they've been, got pr primary responsibility for the, this particular project looking at the epigenetics of prostate cancer. Corinne, Daisy, Natalia, when she was with us, and Jenny Price are working on the role of the epitranscriptome in prostate cancer and breast cancer. And we're very fortunate to have some clinicians working in the group. Mansour is a breast cancer pathologist, Simone is a veterinary pathologist, and Atara is a on radiation oncologist that's joining us from Nigeria um, next week. So these are the folks that get all of the credit for what we're doing. I want to take a step back and just remind you a little bit about androgen signaling and how, how I was taught it has now really been sort of uh, updated. Uh, originally we were told that the androgen receptor is kept in the cytoplasm, silenced in the absence of its hormone, testosterone or dihydrotestosterone. And that's true, it does, it does that. But once the hormone binds to it, it translocates to the nucleus. And unfortunately it's not blanked, it's blanked here, but it translocates in and binds to DNA where the binding of that hormone initiates the recruitment of multiple different proteins that are required to switch on transcription, switch on the genes that androgens regulate. And I've massively simplified this process. There are over 400 different proteins required for the androgen receptor to actually do what you would think is a relatively simple thing, switch on a gene. These different proteins all have distinct enzymatic activities. There are some that act as bridges to recruit in other proteins. There are proteins that act to methylate lysines. There are also proteins that act to demethylate lysines, lysine demethylases, KDMs, lysine, a K, D for demethylase. This is the focus of our talk. And these all cooperate to make the DNA more accessible to the basal transcriptional machinery and enable transcription to occur. We're interested in the androgen receptor and the estrogen receptor because it is the te therapeutic target for two of the most common cancers affecting our society, prostate cancer and breast cancer. One in seven men will get prostate cancer. Not all will die, in fact only a minority will die of prostate cancer, but we have no reliable way of distinguishing those men that will have aggressive disease from those men that will have indolent disease. So it's an enormous cost to our healthcare system that we're probably over-treating. It's a terrible burden on the men that get treated. The side effects are terrible. So we need to work better to identify the mechanisms that make certain prostate cancers more aggressive. The current treatments for aggressive prostate cancer all converge at the androgen receptor. This is like the old saying, putting all of your eggs in one basket. If you drop the basket, all of your eggs are broken. So if your androgen receptor changes during tumor genesis, during the progression of the disease, then all of the drugs that are approved to treat the prostate cancer will now become ineffective. And that is what we see. So after about two years of the use of these anti, uh, 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 androgen deprivation therapies, we see resistance emerges and the tumors progress to a hormone refractory and curable state. So two years is not a long survival benefit for patients, so we have to do better. So we and others have come up with the concept of not just targeting the androgen receptor, but looking at the other proteins that the androgen receptor depends upon to activate transcription. And for reasons that I'll outline now, we've decided to focus in on this family of lysine demethylases because we think these are attractive therapeutic targets. Now, to go back to uh, your high school, I'm going to remind you a little bit about epigenetics. So we're all familiar with the double helix of DNA and how it's packaged into chromatin and into chromosomes within the cell. We now know that this is actually a functional packaging. If we look at a crystal structure of the base unit of chromatin, the nucleosome, we see that there are histone proteins around which the DNA is wound. And the crystal structure was very revealing. These proteins have projections called histone tails that actually interact and interdigitate with the DNA. So any modification of these projections will alter how the DNA interacts with the histone proteins. So this would be a way of changing how a gene could be switched on or switched off by simply changing the biochemistry of these tails. And that's the focus of our project. And we're going to focus in on one type of modification, modification of the lysine amino acid. 
because it enables enormous complex data to be stored within the nucleosome. This is the lysine amino acid. It can exist in an acetylated state. And in certain positions in the histone tail, that acetylation is associated with the switching on of the gene. The lysine can be mono, di, or trimethylated. And each of those acts as a different signal to how that region of DNA should be interpreted by those things that are switching on or switching off genes. And if we pause for a moment to think about the binary code, the complexity of a computer system all relies on the state of either a zero or a one. That's the whole basis of computer code. We see on this individual lysine residue that there are five statuses that can be encoded on each lysine. So this enables the nucleosome to store a lot of information right at that gene to signal whether it should be switched on or switched off in that cell. It's even more complicated than that. That was just one lysine. But if you look at this one histone tail of histone H3, you will see that there are multiple lysines throughout. So you can see that this is a very elegant way of storing epigenetic information right in the region of the gene where it should be switched on. And you will also notice that these are all of the different enzymes that are involved in regulating the methylation or acetylation state of those lysine residues. Each of those are potential pharmacological targets, potentially enabling us to fine-tune, to tweak whether a gene should be switched on or switched off. So that's the background to the project. So now let's focus in on lysine demethylases. There are three catalytic mechanisms, and I'm going to ignore one <laughs> that's not relevant to our talk. So I'm going to focus in on the demethylases that are involved in lysine demethylases. So there are two distinct catalytic mechanisms. That means that we can use two different types of drugs, which will have different affinities for the large family of demethylases. There are some 20 demethylases. So by understanding the pharmacology of these targets, we might be able to target the KDMs specifically within prostate cancer and have less side effects on other tissues by targeting those KDMs that are overexpressed in the diseased tissue. Now we've been working on this for a long time with uh, Regina's former mentor, Jenny Persson in, in Sweden, working with uh, Dr. Gudis and with uh, Dr. Brian Robinson. We've shown that LSD1, also called lysine demethylase, is upregulated in prostate cancer. It is a predictor of biochemical recurrence, and we've shown that it causes this recurrence and this aggressive disease by upregulating the proangiogenic factor VEGFA. So that was published a number of years ago in 2013. More recently, we asked the question why is LSD1 KDM1A upregulated? And we found that there is a microRNA which serves to repress this KDM in normal prostate cells. So if we look at this schematically, there is a microRNA which is androgen regulated and it up, is upregulated to switch off all of the machinery that's required for the androgen receptor. So in this way, a non-malignant prostate cell has a handbrake to stop androgens driving its proliferation. It can switch off androgen signaling as an auto-feedback loop. So that's great, except if you lose the expression of microRNA-137. In such a situation, there is nothing to stop the overexpression of these coactivators, which would then act to amplify androgen signaling and thereby drive proliferation. And that's what we find. Within prostate cancer, microRNA-133 is densely DNA methylated. It's the microRNA is no longer there to repress. You get an amplification of androgen signaling. We started our project looking at for regulators for KDM1A, but the project got more interesting because we found that MIR-137 not only targeted 1A, but all of the other KDMs that were known to be required by the androgen receptor. It was a coherent network, an autoregulatory negative feedback network. How cool is that? So we took that project forward and we wanted to look at were any of these other KDMs also androgen receptor regulated. And we actually found that two were. One, KDM5B was known to be an androgen receptor co-regulator and it is modestly upregulated by androgens. 
and this androgen induction of KDM5A depends on another KDM, KDM1A. We found more robust activation of KDM7A, of which there were only two publications. Nobody knew anything about what this KDM7A does, except that it is a lysine demethylases. Because so little was known about it, we were fearful that we might end up going down a wrong road. So we decided to take both of them forward to hedge our bets. So we have now looked at KDM1A, 7A, and KDM5B in human prostate cancer specimens. Again, all of our research has to be patient-focused. There's no point in us studying a biological curiosity that has no relevance to patients. So we're indebted to Brian for providing access to a very well curated large prostate cancer cohort. Also, Jenny has provided us with access to a unique cohort in Sweden. And this reflects what I referred to yesterday as the essential partnerships, where we've worked for over a decade together, being able to cooperate on these projects. And the distance between our countries really doesn't matter when we have a common goal of addressing prostate cancer. So what we can see is that consistent with the literature, KDM1A is overexpressed in prostate cancer, KDM5B is overexpressed in prostate cancer, so these are appealing therapeutic targets. And although nobody's ever looked at it before, we see evidence that KDM7A is overexpressed in a subset of prostate cancers, and we're currently finishing the scoring and correlations of those cohorts right now. So, just as you, our colleague suggested, the first thing that we do when we're trying to understand a, pro uh, a protein is we use siRNAs to knock it down. They have the appealing factor in that they're cheap, they're fast, we can do it quickly and we can generate preliminary data. These are difficult proteins to knock down because they're very large, they have a large, long half-life, but Veronica, through enormous grit and determination, was able to knock down KDM5B and a variety of different prostate cancer cell lines and was able to show that KDM5B is required and so by knocking it down at the mRNA level she showed that it is required for PSA induction um, by androgen in hormone dependent prostate cancer as is VEGF so it behaves like LSD1 KDM1A in hormone dependent prostate cancer however in the more clinically important model reflecting hormone refractory prostate cancer KDM5B appears to do something very different. It is not required for androgen-induced regulation of PSA. It's not required for androgen-induced expression of VEGFA. Therefore, any drug that seeks to target KDM5B in the hormone refractory context won't work. So we were very lucky that we didn't choose to just prioritize KDM5B because this is not going to be a clinical target. We've got interesting biology, but it's not going to be clinically useful. However, we decided to persevere and look at whether inhibitors would block proliferation of the prostate cancer cells. And yes, indeed, they do. We're able to use, there are two uh, inhibitors available that have, uh, certainly for the case of CPI455, have a good affinity for the targets. And we can show that the KDM inhibitors inhibit proliferation of prostate cancer cells. That project is beginning to wind up because it's not going to be clinically relevant. So we started to focus more on KDM7A. So it is a novel androgen receptor coactivator, and we show that it is required for PSA and VEGF induction by androgen in both hormone-dependent and refractory prostate cancers. So this is a more appealing therapeutic target because it would work in the type of cancers for which there is currently no therapy. There is a good inhibitor available as a lead representative molecule, and we're able to show that this can inhibit the proliferation of prostate cancer cells in culture. Likewise, a less effective inhibitor, diminizide, also inhibits proliferation of prostate cancer cells. So that's all encouraging that this is a potential therapeutic target. We were also interested then in trying to dissect out the interdependence of all of these KDMs at the androgen receptor complex. Why does the androgen receptor need so many proteins to do something that's very similar? So we found a new high affinity inhibitor of KDM1A, and we were able to show that, as predicted, it should block androgen induction of PSA. That's in the literature, so our system is working. 
We then used siRNAs to knock down in combination all of the different KDMs. We hoped to see a synergistic effect by knocking down multiple different parts of the complex. So by pulling apart your engine, if you pull apart all of it, it should work less well. And that's what we found. It looked very encouraging that there was a synergistic effect. However, it got more complicated when we started to look at the drugs. So we, this is a complex data slide, and I'm just going to draw your attention to one part of it, where we've looked at the inhibition of KDM1A and KDM7A combined. These inhibitors seem to compete with each other and <coughs> restore androgen signaling. So this has identified an interdependence of KDM1A and 7A. So a treatment of um, KDM of, with the namaline, which is a KDM1A inhibitor, a 25 micromolar, reduces androgen induction of PSA by about 60 to 70 percent. When we include a KDM7A inhibitor, it's less effective at blocking PSA. So this is showing an interdependence of the KDMs in, co in their regulation of androgen signaling. So where does this leave us? Are we any closer to new targeted therapies targeting the androgen receptor co-regulator? Well, I think we are. Monotherapies with KDM1A inhibitors have already entered clinical trials in lung cancer. They've not been very successful, but that probably reflects that lung cancer is not a classically considered an endocrine-driven cancer. But at least there is the justification and proof of principle to take this into other cancer contexts. And some of our colleagues at the ICR in London are starting to do that. So we think that our work and their work is beginning to rationally justify KDMs as a novel therapy, which should hopefully bypass resistance to the current suite of androgen deprivation therapies that directly target the androgen receptor. So with that, I want to thank all of the people who've done the work, in particular the people in the lab, but also we work very closely with Professor Gudis, uh, including an annual visits to our lab where we can do some experiments not feasible in, in Nottingham. We have outstanding clinical collaborators, including Brian, David Nannis, Doug Scher, Steve Borgian for over 15 years, and also colleagues in Sweden who we've been very dependent upon and were funded by various generous funders. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Anton. Yes, yeah. There is always the role of buying one promoter. There, there must be some specific, promoter specificity of different conferences. What's known about that? That's a really good question. Um, very little is known about it. Um, the, the complex at the promoter, the composition of it seems to be dynamic. Uh, as we know, the, when the receptor first binds to a promoter, there are, are several rounds of non productive transcription. Um, the, 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 the best resolution of the composition of the complex is in the 10 to 15 minute range. So that's probably not good enough to capture how dynamic the receptor is at sampling what co-regulators are being recruited in. How are these co-regulators being recruited in? They read the modifications on the histone tails. So there is a sequence of recruitment of the KDMs. As they read the tail, they then modify other mod uh, um, residues along the tail, which in turn then enables other co-regulators to come in, dependent on that modification being present. Now that's why we see this, this challenge of when we inhibit KDM1A, KDM7A behaves differently. Because KDM1A has the unique capacity that we're aware of of acting as both a co-activator to switch on transcription and also as a co-repressor to switch off transcription, depending on the phosphorylation status of other uh, training residues within the histone tail. So it's constantly sampling the information within the cell and fine-tuning the response, the transcriptional response to hormone. Is this sequence of events is known? No. So, we're the first people to actually start to look at the interdependence of co-regulator recruitment.
it, it, it had been viewed as being a very mechanical thing, that one would come in, do its business, go again. It seems to be much more dynamic. To address those questions, though, is technically very difficult. We would have to use chromatin immunoprecipitation assays, which are very dependent on the quality of the antibody. The antibodies for these large proteins are not particularly good. You would need to have very rapid resolution. We're depending on um, cross-linking cells with formaldehyde. I'm not sure how rapid that is. I don't know how it disrupts the complex itself. So biochemically, this is a difficult uh, question to answer. So that's why I think the pharmacological tools, where we will individually pull out KDMs and see the consequence on uh, transcriptional activation and then putting them back in and doing combination knockdowns might be the, the way to actually address the codependence of the co-regulators. Co-regulators themselves are subject to phosphorylation, um, so receptor tyrosine kinases also act to modulate the nuclear receptor signaling by changing the ability of the co-activator to interact with the receptor. So that's very dynamic, very rapid regulation. Uh, there's multiple layers of regulation within the co-regulator themselves. Albert. You described a, a very complex uh, system of uh, regulation uh, with many, many factors involved. Uh, and uh, just a crazy idea. Uh, well, first of all, how evolutionarily concerned is this machinery? Because uh, any change uh, would require that the whole system <coughs> would have to readjust. And secondly, uh, for example, uh, are there well, it would be maybe interesting to look at uh, SMPs, uh, which, uh, again, because the, the system is very complex and everything is dependent on each other, so even minute changes uh, uh, would uh, probably have a, a profound effect on the system. So that might actually discourage from uh, SMPs being present in this uh, yeah. key players. Yeah. Um, to the first question, the epigenetic mechanisms are conserved throughout the eukaryotic system. Um, there may not be the exact functional diversity of the KDM complexes, but the mechanisms are conserved throughout evolutionary time. In terms of SNPs, that's a really good point. Um, there is a further complexity in that SNPs within the promoter regions alters the shape of the receptor which in turn alters which nuclear receptors, uh, co-regulators it will recruit. So there's a combined effect of both the SNP within the regulatory region of the genes regulated by the receptors and SNPs within the co-regulators themselves will change their behavior. Okay, thank you very much. So that concludes our morning session. Thank you for your attention and thank all the speakers. <laughs>